Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on an early Monday for some and a midday on others. We have participants from coast to coast to coast on this session. Today we are addressing the issue of infection prevention and disaster response and never before has it been so important that we get these things right. In the time of COVID-19, critical issues have come to light about infection prevention and disaster response, particularly in regards to older people. And so some of the issues we're gonna really delve into today. We've got 90 minutes today to explore with our top experts on these critical issues. Let me just start, however, by thanking our sponsors, Sanofi, HelpAge Canada, GSK, the Canadian Frailty Network, the Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada, AgeWell, and the United Way Healthy Aging Program. It's so important that we make sure that all of our sessions are free to participants and our sponsors help that to happen. We also know that it takes a village and these important organizations are presenting co-hosts with us with a special shout out to Help Age Canada who's co-presenting this series with us. A few housekeeping details before we get into it. Your microphones and video will be turned off during the webinar. If you want to adjust the video size of the speakers, you can just drag the line between the video frame and the slides to the left. And some of you will want to be able to see it a lot of people at once, and some people will only want to see some people at once when we're in our moderated session. So I can encourage you that you can get a bit familiar with doing that. You can adjust it to your own convenience. We are recording, and I uh, just want to let you know that this is being recorded and will be posted on our CanAge website and through YouTube. We are also broadcasting through YouTube and Facebook Live today. So a couple of issues about how to engage. Welcome. So we are having an active set of conversations which you will see in our chat box. So just to orient you, if you haven't done this before, you will see on your screen at the bottom, you may need to roll your, uh, your cursor over it, a number of different icons. One of them will have Q&A, polling, some of it will have chat and so on. So we are welcoming you to engage actively as a side in our chat box. I'm just writing here, hi everyone. And you will see that you need, need to drop down the list where it says all panelists and attendees so that everybody can uh, know where you're from. So we encourage you to welcome, put your name in, tell us where you are and what organization that you might be representing. You'll also see uh, some information that we're putting in live during the webinar. So you see as well that one of our team members, Paula's put in some information as well. So welcome again to our voices of Canada's seniors, a roadmap to an age inclusive Canada session on infection prevention and disaster response. So there is a super quick evaluation at the end. It's really important for us to know what went right and what you'd like us to be able to change and modify for next time. Don't worry if you or your friends and colleagues couldn't make this exact time. We, while we're broadcasting live on Facebook and through YouTube, it also will be recorded and shared on our website and through our partner organization's website. So if you really want to be able to share this information, it's no problem, you can. Our hashtag today are CanAge Seniors and CanAge Voices. We're talking about an age inclusive Canada. We're talking vaccines. We're also uh, using the hashtag of Immunize Canada, which is an important organization, and the flu shot, which we're trying to show how critically important it is for everyone to get the flu shot this season. And never before has it been perhaps more important. And we're talking about disaster prevention. So here's our agenda today. Uh, I'm your moderator, Laura Tamblin Watts. I'm the CEO of CanAge, which is Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization. I'm going to just take a few minutes and introduce you to our Voices of Canada's Seniors, a roadmap to an age-inclusive Canada document, be able to make sure that you can get a good sense of how to use it and what does it mean to you and your work today. The uh, Voices of Canada Seniors document is available on our website at canage.ca slash voices. We have uh, that information also dynamically posted on the website. So you can use the document in a dynamic way on the website or you can download the whole thing. 
I'm going to just do a quick introduction of our panelists. Their bios are posted and have been shared with you, but I just want to pull out a few key highlights so you can really appreciate what incredible participant and rock star expert panelists we have today. What we're going to do is we're going to give everybody in our expert panel about five or so minutes to share what they think they need to do to make Canada more age inclusive, particularly about infection prevention and disaster response. Then we move it to a very dynamic session. I'll be moderating, I'll be getting your questions. And I encourage you, if you can see your control panel, you'll see a little double bubble icon with a Q&A. If you click that, you can send your questions directly and we will make sure that we capture your questions and we pose them to the panelists. So we have a really interactive session of Roundtable and you can get your questions answered. We're going to share at the end some additional resources and how you can stay in touch and take some action. So Canada was unfortunately somewhat unique in the OECD countries by not having a plan for its aging population. And that's not something to be proud of. We've talked about different senior strategies, but nothing stuck and certainly nothing came that captured all of the wonderful, wonderful resources that we have developed in Canada in one place to easily help us navigate what we need to do as citizens, as representatives of the community, as seniors, as not-for-profits and community organizations, as private companies, and as governments. So this document is a place, a space, a roadmap to what we need to do to affect positive change. And I'm hoping that it really speaks to you as a, a usable place and that you see your work and yourselves in it. The roadmap is really simple to navigate around. We have six compass points, which you see here. Violence and abuse prevention, which we explored on Friday morning. Optimal health and wellness, which we explored on Friday afternoon, that we took the weekend off and you've joined us here for infection prevention and disaster response. About half an hour after our session finishes here, we're gonna start our next session, caregiving, long-term care, home care, and housing resources. And I really wanna encourage you to grab a quick bite and join us because that is also gonna be a wonderful session. Then tomorrow, at the same time, Eastern 11 to 12.30, then a half an hour break, we engage in economic security questions and then look in half an hour later between 1 and 2.30 Eastern at the issue of social inclusion. So let's talk about infection prevention and disaster response. So our six compass points have 40 issues and amongst them 100, 135 recommendations. So our issues, which if you go onto our website, you can click on an arrow next to them and it will open up and expand and you'll see the key recommendations under each issue are laid out for you here. We're really concerned about vaccine uptake and reform issues. And that means as well as how vaccines are approved, who approves them, how fast they're being approved, what they're bought, how they're bought. We're really also, interested in thinking about adult vaccination being prioritized during COVID-19. And I think we'll hear, you know, it's not going to be a quick, you know, six months and we're done. I think we're looking at living with these particular issues raised by COVID for some time. We've got recommendations about having an adult vaccine schedule and how to track uptake. What are some of the ways that we can learn from how we manage with vaccines and the younger populations? We're going to talk about infection control and long-term care as well. So that's not all just, yes, vaccines play a role in that, but also what do we need to do in long-term care to support greater infection control. And lastly, we finish with disaster response. And I'm in uh, Nova Scotia right now, and we just had a hurricane come through. And I can tell you that when it comes to disasters and, and, and they're as predictable as the weather, quite literally as predictable as the weather, you know, we know that we can't just rely on community members to do the right thing and look out for the neighbors, but we actually need to have a more coordinated response, particularly in times of climate change. So I'm uh, Laura Tamblin Watts. I'm the CEO of CanAge. I have been working in the field for quite a long time and I come from a background in law. And it's through that background that I became involved in thinking about what do we need to do 
in order to make sure we have a senior's voice at the table? What do we need to do to make sure that we have an expert group that can raise the voices up and support and amplify the voice of Canadian seniors? And that's what CanH does. On our panel today, I'm very pleased to introduce you to the following people. Dr. Kamanan Wilson is a senior scientist in the Clinical Epidemiology Program at Ottawa Hospital Research Centre and also at the Briere Research Centres. He's a specialist in general internal medicine at the Ottawa Hospital and also that advisor for innovation in Briere. And I'm, I'm encouraging Kamanan to talk a little bit about some of those areas of innovation he's been involved in. You know, his work crosses the health and housing continuum as well as the life course perspective. So he's got you know, expertise in child and maternal health, as well as, you know, increasingly looking at kind of the life course when it comes to infection prevention. His work also touches ethics, law, policy, and he's been very involved in things like research programs for transfusion medicine, vaccine safety, and metabolomics. We are really excited as well, and I'm going to encourage him to highlight for you a little bit of the creation of Canada's national immunization app can immunize as well. So we're delighted to have him today. Welcoming back a dear friend, and I say welcome back because Greg was part of our kickoff on National Seniors Day. He's a director of international and corporate relations for the International Federation on Aging, a co-host of this series. And Greg's background really does span, you know, a global set of work from his work as a deputy minister in the Australian government to his international commitment to supporting greater vaccine uptakes. He's been involved with the health and housing continuum, aged care reforms, trying to support rural and remote communities throughout. And since he's joined the 2003 version of the IFA, he's been building capacity in healthcare programs in Africa, working with human rights commissions, and really also talking about the issue of health equity. And I know that Greg will bring some of that health equity component today because many people don't realize you don't get the same vaccines depending on where you live in Canada. And that really is deeply problematic. I'm so pleased as well to introduce you a dear friend of mine, Stephen Cornish. Stephen is the CEO of the David Suki Foundation. He also previously worked with Médecins Sans Frontières here in Canada. And I'm very pleased to say that he has announced that after a tremendous amount of work done with the David Suzuki Foundation, he has been chosen to lead Médecins Sans Frontières globally as the Director General, and it's heading soon to Switzerland to take up that post. There could be no person better placed to discuss the questions of disaster response, whether it be from climate change, whether it be because of infection control, than Stephen. So we're delighted to have him today. His work has been global, his work has been local, and I know that in it, he really is responding to a calling which we know we need with regards to COVID-19. Umberto and I have known each other for a few years now, and I'm so pleased that he will bring not just his expertise as a pharmacist to the conversation, but also to share some of the lived experiences that he's had with regards to flu and the impacts of flu on his father. So we're really gonna get a chance to understand both that critical element as a pharmacist, but also hear about the family experiences that he's had with his father getting the flu and what changes that made in his life. So at this point, we get to get into it. And I am going to invite in turn, each of our expert panelists to unmute their video one at a time. And I will ask them to share five to seven minutes or so about how we can make Canada more age inclusive with regards to infection prevention and disaster response. I'm gonna do each one of those in turn and then we're gonna open it up and we're gonna have everybody on screen and we'll engage in a very active session. So get out the chat box on your screen, get out the Q&A box and get ready to enjoy. I'm so very pleased today to welcome first, Greg Shaw, a dear friend, a fabulous expert, 
and a leader in the area of infection prevention. Greg, I invite you to unmute your video and come to take the stage. Thank you very much, Laura. I am unmuted, but I'm still not my video showing. So just bear with me and I'll get that working. No problem at all. And so one of the things that is critically important okay. to remember as well is that, you know, Greg has been a leader, as I say, not just in Canada, but in health equity in Canada and around the world. And, and when we're thinking about, you know, things like vaccines or how we respond to infection prevention more broadly, I'm also, you know, encouraging you to draw a little bit of awareness to what's covered in some places and what's not covered in other places. I know that it's quite a surprise to many people to realize that just because you're in Toronto, you may get a certain set of coverage, but if you happen to be living in vaccine in, uh, in British Columbia or Halifax, you might have a very different experience in what's covered or not. Over to you, Greg. Thank you very much, Laura. And uh, thank you to CanAge and um, everyone that's online uh, listening today. I wanna to talk about a couple of things um, and it really stems from my history with the Australian government and developing some of the aged care strategies in Australia 30 years ago, up to 30 years ago. But Let's talk a little bit about COVID-19 and how it disproportionately affects vulnerable populations, including older people and those with chronic disease, such as diabetes, heart and lung disease. Every year, the same individuals are most impacted by seasonal influenza, which is really what we don't know is what the double whammy of both COVID and influenza might be or pneumococcal. So, the CDC estimates uh, that around 70 to 85 percent of influenza related deaths have occurred among people aged over 65 years of age. Where death is not a result of influenza, uh, is not a result, influenza can lead to certainly hospitalizations, long standing diminished functional capacity, mental health capacity, as well as acute or long term complications. So, Influenza vaccine is really important, particularly now, because we know that vaccines save lives. There's no, there's no matter, it, it really does. So influenza is one of the most common infections, uh, diseases in the world and kills around 650,000 people every year. Older adults and those with underlying conditions or compromised immune systems are especially at risk of serious life-threatening complications compared with the general population. Immunization is one of the most effective public health interventions against infectious diseases, second only to clean water. But despite national influenza vaccine, vaccination programs and campaigns, uh, time to optimize protection against all age, ages, vaccine coverage rates amongst older people generally remains poor. And this not only exists in Canada, but in countries across the world. If vaccination uptake rates are to remain as an indicator for national campaigns, then they are mediocre at best, with little or no published research on either the effectiveness or awareness raising messages that are provided. It's not only influenza or pneumococcal, but it's also whether it's shingles, Certainly, um, you know, we at, at the IFA have been working in the area of vaccines and trying to improve the uptake rates for far nine years now across the world. But what we don't know is what the impact of COVID-19 is going to have when we hit the winter season. What we do know is from the evidence in Australia um, for their winter season, the actual numbers of older people getting uh, influenza were certainly less than the year before. One can but hope that that will be the case, case for us here. But that doesn't diminish the need for us to improve the vaccination uptake rates across Canada. And when I talk about the vaccination uptake rates across Canada, Laura did make the point that there is differences from provinces to provinces, given that it really is a provincial jurisdiction in terms of access to medications or treatments, um, whether it's vaccines or medications, it differs on where you live. So people in Ontario might have 
better access to a range of medications and vaccines than people in Prince Edward Island, for argument's sake, or out where Laura is now. Or how those pipelines to deliver those vaccines are, are given. So it's, it's interesting how many countries allow pharmacists to give high dose vaccine for influenza to older people. Um, I think that's going to be the case now in Ontario, which is a great, um, I suppose, uptake from what we had in previous years. But influenza really impacts people in long-term care. And when I think about the outbreaks that occur in long-term care, I always think of some of the building standards and standards that apply in this country. Now, I can tell you that 25 years ago, uh, when I was actually approving long-term care facilities in Australia and their design, if a plan came across my desk where there was multiple people in one room, those plans would never get approved. Interestingly, here in Ontario, roughly prior to COVID-19, roughly 63% of, of all, all beds were dual or multiple bed occupancies. And even those that had single rooms, and that's approximately 37%, most of those had a shared washroom, not a shared, a shared washroom, which consisted of a shower, uh, not a shower, a toilet and hand basin. How can you minimise infections when multiple people are sharing different facilities in a home? So the current standard in long-term care in Ontario is a minimum of one bathroom per 25 residents. So how do you actually maximise infection control when you've got 25 residents perhaps using one bathroom? I would suggest that you can't. The building standards in this country really do need to change. You know, they've taken steps now to minimise multiple bedrooms, so they've reduced three to four bedrooms to two. But I would say that they need to be reducing them back down to one. I've often talked to people um, around long-term care design in this country, and I've said, why is it that we don't do single rooms with an ensuite in every room for single residents? It would certainly minimise infec infection across all cases of infection, uh, because it would be the only the resident particularly using that shower or bathroom. I've got and if I can share my screen, I'm going to show you two pictures of, of a nursing home that I was involved with 20 years ago in terms of what it looked like. Um, so if I just go to, I can't, I'm not, I can't share my screen at the moment. No, nope, I can't. So anyway, I can't share my screen. So it's, it's really single room with a ensuite within the room. And to give an, a, a better example, my mother who was in a nursing home 15 years ago, she had a ceiling track system, which could transport her from her bed to her bathroom for her shower or to her sitting chair in that particular room. Doesn't exist here. And always the case is it's too expensive to do. I would argue the case that when the disability movement started talking about accessible transport, accessible buses were really expensive. They're not expensive, they're the norm these days. We need a aged care system which changes its design standards in this country to minimise the risks for influenza outbreaks, pneumococcal and other infections which occur in long-term care. So with that, I will leave you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Greg. And we'll make sure that we get that to you as a slide as well. So thank you for that. We'll, uh, we'll share that information yeah. for you. You know, I, I also am excited that this afternoon, we're going to be talking about the C in Voices, which looks at the uh, caregiving questions with regards to both long-term care, home care, and also with regards to um, the key issues along that health and housing continuum. I'm going to invite now 
Dr. Wilson to the stage, our proverbial stage, and I'm excited to hear, again, picking up on some of those questions about infection prevention and disaster response. Dr. Wilson, I invite you to unmute your video and take the stage. Wait, I'm, I'm trying to, oh, to unmute my video, <laughs> um, but you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you just fine. No problem. To... Well, you get that sorted out. Um, yeah. I'm excited to, okay, uh, I'm to good. welcome you to our proverbial stage. Thanks Great. very much. Well, so over to you. Thanks for inviting me, Laura. And that was uh, some great words spoken already. So, um, you know, I'd like to start beginning. Uh, I'd like to begin by just discussing the, the generational divide that's been created by COVID. And it, it's a unique disease in how disproportionate it impacts the different generations. And, and we're seeing that. We're seeing a tragedy really affecting older Canadians. But I, I think that the danger in looking at it from this lens, it, it, it's it tends to divide Canadians into these different generations, and it, it belies some of the interconnectedness that's actually occurring. Uh, so this is not just a tragedy affecting older Canadians. It, it definitely is affecting them disproportionately from a health impact, but it's affecting all of us. And I think what we need to recognize is what affects older Canadians has a spillover effect on younger Canadians, and what affects younger Canadians has a spillover effect on older Canadians. So let me give you some examples there. So as, as we, you know, as an older Canadian unfortunately falls sick with COVID, uh, you know, they can be admitted to hospital in, in disproportionate rates. And during their treatment, they'll require medical and ICU hospital beds. And then obviously this is, this is terrible for them. This is terrible for their families. But it, it also occupies these beds. And then the availability of these beds, the availability of rooms in eMERGE uh, become limited. And this puts a real stress on the health system. And then this has a cascade down effect that affects the ability of, of younger Canadians to access care. And, you know, we were talking about vaccination. Eventually, when we do go towards measures such as lockdown, we're seeing even immunization rates drop, a pediatric immunization rates drop. So, so an illness that's affecting one generation is now actually having an indirect impact on pediatric immunization rates. Uh, and, and, but similarly, what we're seeing right now a second wave of infections that's affecting younger Canadians. And, and these younger Canadians, I mean, we need to have some sympathy with their situation. This has had a serious negative effect on, on what's natural in being younger, their ability to socialize and engage with their friends. It's also having an impact on their employability and, and perhaps their future, their, their future uh, as the, the debt rates increase. But, but what we know with these infections in younger Canadians is fortunately they aren't as affected as much, but we start to see a cascade up effect. And it, it, these younger Canadians could affect, infect their parents and their parents may fall sick, but then their parents may infect their parents, which uh, the grandparents of the younger Canadians. And then we start to see the impact on the health system again. And we see these older Canadians get sick and unfortunately, sometimes critically. So we're seeing two sort of uh, Im impacts here where older Canadians impacted by COVID affects the health of younger Canadians and younger Canadians getting infected by COVID can impact older Canadians. So I think we need to recognize generations are actually connected here and, and not disparate. So, so how are some ways we can reconnect these generations? Uh, it was discussed earlier the importance of improving our long-term care. You know, that's become a highlight just not in Canada but around the world. The world wasn't ready for this. And, and innovation is needed in this space. And we need to create innovation that can allow Canadians to age in place, age at home, or to be aged more securely in long-term care. And, and this would be perhaps an ideal place where we could start to train younger Canadians so that they can build these long-term care homes of the future. And in, in doing so, we connect them with this older generation, many of them who are their grandparents whom they love dearly. We also provide them with the skills for the future and employability. And it's also an opportunity for Canada because this is a global problem. It's a multi-trillion dollar industry that's going to need to be rapidly created. And you know, I believe Canada is well placed to lead. And, and another example of how we can connect generations is in the importance of vaccination. Uh, as was mentioned, you know, the high dose vaccine for influenza is one of the best ways we can protect older Canadians from the flu. 
But there was a famous study actually out of Japan published in the New England Journal, which showed that when they were vaccinating children for the influ with the influenza vaccine, they dramatically reduced the deaths rates from pneumonia and, uh, and, and other illnesses amongst older Japanese. Unfortunately, they had an anti-vaccine movement and they had to stop that policy. And then they saw a increase, a, a return to higher rates of pneumonia and death in older Japanese. So again, this demonstrates how these generations are connected and how they, by intervening in one population, you can potentially benefit another. And, and I'd just like to conclude then about you know, where we're going in this pandemic. And, and the immediate issue is the, the issue of the influenza season. Uh, you know, fortunately, there's some good news that our social distancing measures, uh, at least in the Southern Hemisphere, seem to have reduced the transmission of influenza. But if we did have two circulating respiratory viruses at the same time, you know, that could be catastrophic from a variety of perspectives. So one is it could significantly overburden our already overburdened health system. We know the flu alone is a, a tremendous burden. But you know, even if you're one of those Canadians who may wonder, well, should I get the flu vaccine? I'm not sure. You know, this year, it's a no-brainer. First of all, you should do it to protect your health. You should do it to protect the health of your loved ones. But the flu looks a lot like COVID, and you'll have a fever, you'll have a cough, and you won't know. And if you don't know, you're going to have to go through all of the procedures that you need to go through when you're a suspected COVID. If you could reduce that by 50% or more by getting a flu vaccine, you could really improve you know, your quality of your life. So, and that would also reduce the strain on our overburdened testing systems, contact tracing systems, and all of the other amazing initiatives that public health has brought forward. So this is the year definitely to get your flu vaccine. And I will strongly recommend you use Can Immunize to track your flu vaccine. It's a, free downloadable app and also available on the web. And it will also remind you every year about the, the flu vaccine. And just some final words about a COVID vaccine. It's, it's on the horizon. There are 11 vaccines in phase three trials. Five are actually in limited use in, in Russia and China. Uh, this is the fastest development of a vaccine in human history. We've compressed a 15 year development period down to one year. There will be increased uncertainty with this vaccine. Uh, there will also be scarcity with this vaccine. It will not, there will not be enough available for everybody upon initial release. And we're going to have to prioritize. Now, the UK just put out a statement saying that they're actually going to prioritize older people in the UK, over 50. Uh, those are the most vulnerable from COVID, and, and, and that's who they are initially signaling will receive the vaccine first. Uh, you know, we, we again, like the flu vaccine, it, there's going to be some uncertainty about effectiveness in very, in, in much older populations because of uh, the waning immunity that older, uh, older individuals have. But, you know, that is a currently the plan from at least one country, and we'll be hearing in Canada soon what our distribution strategy is. So, you know, there is hope on the horizon. A uh, vaccine will hopefully be available by this late spring and it seems to be our best way out of this. And you know, we need to find the best way to distribute this vaccine, not just to help older Canadians, but to help all Canadians. And we are all connected through this process. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's, uh, you know, it's really a daunting thing to look at our fall and winter and realize that in some cases, the symptoms of COVID-19 are so closely tracked to the flu. I mean, I even had a head cold a couple of weeks ago, and I mean, it wouldn't have been anything to make myself think about, but the first thing I did was called 811 as I have to where I'm here in Nova Scotia to a fringe for the appropriate testing. And that's the first time I've been tested in all of this time. And I have to tell you, the feeling of it, and I guess it wasn't even flu, it was just some, some small virus. The feeling of worry, not only for your own well-being, but for everybody that you love or anyone that you've been with is profound. So we know how critically important it is to stay healthy and well right now. And so thank you so much, Dr. Wilson, for your comments about some of the ways that we can do that. I want to pivot a little bit and bring in our, our friend and colleague um, and, and, and hear a little bit more from Umberto about 
what it's been like for him a little bit about his expertise in an academic sense as a as a pharmacist but really maybe to tell a little bit of the story of the lived experience he's had with his father and the impact that flu's had so i'm going to invite umberto to to unmute his video and join us here in the stage let us know if you have any problems doing that you just unmute your video and then you can join us to the stage I had a, a wonderful opportunity to hear him speak and, and meet his father and, and listen firsthand to that lived experience for how impactful getting the flu was for his father and, and really what that is. So I'm better let us know if you can unmute your video and-, uh, and Okay, I'm all right here. You know, yeah, uh, you got the audio perfect. To, so I just wanna come on with the video. That's great. Yeah. And while you're just getting that sorted out, I'm just going to encourage people to go into our Q&A. So you've got that little bubble there and you can type into that bubble some questions that you may have. We're going to make sure that after we get through this fireside uh, chat part that we bring in each of those questions to you. So again, I encourage you to do that. Okay. Okay, we can hear you, but I can't see you at this point. So I'll just see if we can work on it. You can share and start talking, oh. and we'll get ourselves uh, we'll get ourselves sorted out with your video. There it is. I can see myself. Can you see me now? Welcome to the stage, John Berto. Thank you yeah, so hi. much for the time today. Thank you for the invite. It's uh, a pleasure to be here with uh, such an outstanding panel of individuals, and I thank everyone who is attending, taking time out of their uh, very very busy days to attend uh, this webinar. I'm here to share my family's experience regarding influenza because it wasn't just a uh, cold or the bad flu. It was a life changing experience for all of us, especially my dad. At the end of March, 2017, my dad contracted influenza. And from that point, his life has never been the same. He spent nine months away from home recovering. He experienced a shutdown of his body because of the influenza. He went into cardiovascular arrest. He was on life support three times. He had two bacterial pneumonias, he had sepsis. He required a tracheostomy for pulmonary hygiene and respiration, which was done through a tracheotomy he required rehabilitation because he was in bed for so long dad spent 48 days in the icu at st joseph's health center in toronto and then 45 days on the uh, cardio pulmonary unit the, intent, the internal medicine uh, section 4m and from there he went on to rehabilitation from there he went on to a transitional program and he finally came home in january of 2018. before all this my father was a very independent man he drove, he participated in many of the seniors events at my parents' church, at the seniors club that they were part of. And ironically, the weekend that he fell ill and he ended up uh, at the hospital, I found at the home tickets to a seniors dance that weekend. And it broke my heart because I'll never forget he had the, I'll never forget he had the list there of all the, uh, attendees and his friends and he had the table ready to, to spend the evening with his friends with my mom they, they were ready to have a good time and those tickets were right there and so little did he know that by contracting influenza his life would have changed now he solely lives on the first floor of the home he definitely doesn't drive anymore uh, they don't they require personal assistance personal support so it is a life altering experience for my dad, for my mom and for everyone. And with this experience, I became an advocate for the flu zone high dose for seniors. Actually, Sanofi, uh, when they found out about my story, because I, I published it and I, I publicized it and, and I, I, I went live with it, I went on, it was online and they said, wait a minute, what happened here? How, what happened to your dad? And I discussed it with them. And then from there we did more uh, public events I published uh, two stories, one in the Canadian Healthcare Network, a pharmacist perspective, and in the uh, Canadian-Italian experience, a near-fatal experience with influenza. 
And my dad worked in a pharmacy as a pharmacy assistant and his brother's pharmacy for over 40 years. So dad was, vaccinate, was vaccinated every year uh, up until this point. He, he received his vaccine every year. But unfortunately, at the time, Fluzone HD was not available. It was not in stock. So uh, there was only some parts of Canada that had it. And unfortunately, at the time, we could not get it here in Toronto, in Ontario. So he opted for the uh, regular dose. And, you know, before you know it, unfortunately, he was a victim of influenza's uh, other side, which is the hospitalization. And again, he was away from home for nine months. So at this time, he tries his best with mom to uh, live, the, live each day uh, to the fullest. They've been married over you know, be 63 years uh, coming up. So been a long time together and, and he tries, he really does try, but it did take a toll on him and his, his health and life is very much different. So I think for those, for those individuals out there, especially seniors who have this belief that, well, we don't need the flu vaccine because I'm healthy. It's not so much about preventing just the flu. It's about protecting you and keeping, retaining your independence, life, staying healthy and being able to do the things that you enjoy. And community pharmacies are a, a, a great place to go in and, and ask your pharmacist who uh, is hopefully injection certified because many pharmacists are certified in a, to administer uh, vaccines and injections. Talk to your local pharmacist, talk to your pharmacist about vaccines, why they're important. What are your options? Because we're here to help you. We're here to inform you. We're here to support you. So definitely uh, I, I encourage people to take the time to go into your local pharmacy, the pharmacy that you use and get involved, get educated, get the information, know what's out there because pharmacists definitely are healthcare professionals who want to help. They want to, want to educate you and they want to keep the communities as healthy as possible. And again, to all seniors, please do take the influenza vaccine serious. It is something that will help you to be protected against influenza. Thanks so much, Alberto. Really appreciate hearing it. I hope your father continues on his uh, recovery, but I know it's been a long one and has really had a huge impact. People often think when they talk about getting the flu, they, they just think, oh, I'm going to have sniffles or, you know, a little bit. And it's actually an incredibly impactful uh, concern. We talk a lot about the twindemic that is coming. Now, the good sign is we, we have seen from our friends in the South who have been in flu season that it's been flat this year, but that's only, I think, because of a combination of, you know, the the hand washing and the social distancing and so on. We're seeing our our numbers go up and up when it comes to some of our provinces. And I know the last thing we need to have is that twindemic um, as well. I'm going to bring in my dear friend Stephen Cornish here. Stephen, I invite you to unmute your video and join us on the, the stage as well. And when we're talking about you know the issues of infection prevention, we also have to talk about disaster response. You know, the World Health Organization talked about the five megatrends, and one of the megatrends was an aging global population, and the other of the megatrends was you know, climate change. And so many of these issues are looked at in different silos. You know, We think that you know, that's a different issue. It doesn't have anything to do with us. And yet, when we talk about the ability to respond to issues, when we talk about the ability to um, bring to bear the forces that we need to you know, in Canada and around the world, I, I, it's an enormously important issue. Um, Stephen, I'm so grateful that you're going to be able to bring some of those perspectives to us today, and I'm going to uh, turn the stage over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for having me. Uh, really humbled to be part of this conversation, and uh, um, I like your reference to the twindemic, and I would, I would take that twindemic reference more to the to the mega level in, in really combining uh, what we see on the humanitarian and environmental front and what we're seeing now on on the medical front here at home. And um, unfortunately, of course, with uh, climate change growing, um, increased environmental degradation, uh, these risks are only going to uh, continue and to grow. And uh, in such cases, the elderly, people with disabilities, uh, folks with pre-existing conditions, the infirm, they're all 
at particular heightened risk, as, as this panel knows well. And therefore, they require special consideration in our prevention plans, but also in our crisis management and response plans. And we have to ensure that those plans truly live up to their names and are not just uh, things that we put on paper and store away and, and forget to upgrade and to invest in and to take seriously along the way. Uh, we've all uh, been front row to the uh, heart-wrenching policies and practices that, that we've seen inflicted on, on our seniors and elder residents in retirement homes uh, during the first wave of COVID. And it's high time that we start to hold these for-profit institutions to account for the physical, the mental well-being, and the safety of Canadian seniors. And it's interesting to note that uh, when we look at the not-for-profit and municipal homes across the country, um, on average, they had far uh, lower levels of mortality and morbidity, uh, which shows, in fact, that, that much more can and, and should be done. And sadly, uh, in some provinces, we see that many of the providers are still not prepared, despite having had months over the summer to step up their game. And I think it's, it's going to be time that we have legislative changes around staffing levels, resident flows, uh, infection management plans. Um, we will know that, uh, that COVID is not the only type of infection that can sweep through these homes, as, as we've heard from the in intervention of, of Umberto. And so we'll need, for sure, uh, that these homes will either have proper isolation wards and, and proper patient flow and, and uh, caregiver flow, or those patients will need to be hospitalized. And that creates uh, a problem in triage, which, which often, and in the last set, we certainly dealt with in a, in a way to prevent um, overcrowding of, of the hospital systems. Uh, we often encouraged uh, patients to be kept in nursing homes, despite knowing uh, that there was substandard care and there was lack of infection control. Uh, those uh, facilities will also need to be outfitted with rapid tests. We've seen, uh, in those lockdowns, the mental and social anguish uh, on our elderly being separated from their loved ones. Often those loved ones have a strong role in caregiving as well. And so we need to be able to take into consideration that and I have a few thoughts that we'll come back to on, on some other things that can be done around um, telemedicine and, and pre-existing uh, condition and needs lists that can be supported by, by communities in times of disaster. The state of affairs around uh, our old folks' homes is not the exception, sadly, but it's rather the rule in times of precarity. Uh, seniors can all too often suffer, be left behind, or fall through the cracks during humanitarian interventions overseas, but also in emergency response operations um, closer to home. And we've seen this a couple of times in, in the, the past decade. For example, in 2012, during Hurricane Sandy, elderly residents were left stranded in apartment towers with no heat or electricity, uh, without elevators, they were, they were basically um, locked in and forgotten. And for many of them, it was uh, only a matter of days before um, not having enough food, uh, not being able to keep warm, not having their prescriptions refilled. And so at that time, uh, in one of the richest cities of the world, uh, the elderly and those with pre-existing conditions and the disabled were, were really left completely cut off. There were no lists, no census of knowing where these people were, and no ability on the part of the essential services to deal with, uh, with the issue. And at that time, the organization I was working with, Doctors Without Borders, or Médecins Sans Frontières, actually began an emergency mission uh, with explo teams, mobile teams, going throughout the different boroughs um, in order to make contact with, uh, with these seniors and other individuals who were locked in uh, and provided medical care, psychosocial care, and uh, often the very basics like drug refills and food delivery and even communication services. Uh, cell phones ran out within a couple of days and they would then just bring cell phones so that these people could connect to their loved ones and let them know that they were okay. We also saw during Hurricane uh, Katrina uh, that uh, those over the age of 60 years old uh, represented 75% of the fatalities despite being only 16% of uh, the population by aggregate. And myself, I've been 10 years overseas responding to emergencies and have seen and witnessed uh, many times the same types of trends during emergencies, where the elderly were often left uh, behind in conflict settings, uh, sometimes uh, of their own volition, they're unwilling to be 
uh, an added burden on families or they're not sure that they'll be able to leave or they want to stay behind to uh, take care of family possessions and family uh, uh, homes. Uh, in times of uh, food insecurity, you often see the elderly uh, become severely uh, undernourished, either because they're sacrificing food stuff for younger uh, family members or because they simply uh, can't uh, make the distances and, uh, and fight their way to the front of food distribution lines. So we've seen that, that trend, sadly, uh, quite often. And one of your sponsors here, HelpAge International, um, has pointed out that the psychological toll um, of during conflict, disasters, and insecurity uh, can also be much more severe for older people. And that can induce high levels of anxiety, of depression, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and, uh, and really affect uh, seniors during humanitarian crises. Uh, we've touched on, and the, and the um, issue of today is around infectious disease, and we know that uh, seniors are at increased risk from infectious disease during times of crisis. When systems go out, when food, when power, all of these things cause stress and other stressors on the body. Uh, across the world, we see rates of HIV, tuberculosis, diarrhea, pneumonia, for example, that can spike after any type of an emergency, whether it's a, a hurricane or a storm. And of course, these uh, conditions present differently in older people and can quickly progress and have side effects. And we've mentioned here on, on, on vaccines, but we haven't talked about costs and costs and access to vaccines across much of the world and even here at home remains an issue. Uh, it was raised on shingles vaccine and that's often not covered uh, by, by different plans in different areas. But the, the vaccine costs and access to vaccination is a huge issue also in, in ensuring that we have proper coverage. Uh, something we haven't talked about as much is chronic health conditions, which can definitely be exacerbated and often become life-threatening. Uh, once it's in a period of crisis and other risks and complications arise. Uh, often medication is in so short supply, health facilities are overwhelmed, can become inaccessible or disrupted, and managing those non-communicable diseases can become a huge uh, challenge. I've seen in a number of places where patients will ration insulin or where access to dialysis is interrupted. And, uh, and so when, when the system is in crisis, uh, it can move very quickly to become uh, permanently life-altering or even deadly, especially for uh, seniors and, and those who already have pre-existing conditions. And, and finally, the disruption and the breakdown of normal family and community support structures. This can leave seniors feeling completely isolated, disorientated, and the mental anguish and trauma, I think we've, we've heard stories about it, but I'm not sure we've captured it in a, in a sort of mega trend in a way that, uh, that uh, we were able to, to bring the proper type of assistance that would be required. And I think there, we have so many new technologies. Uh, we can't always depend on technology because that can also go out in a time of uh, emergency. Uh, but with backup generation and communication systems, uh, it would seem to me that we should certainly be able to have uh, telemedical access, uh, uh, psychosocial access, and network access to ensure uh, that elderly can remain connected to their friends and family who are often in a place like Canada could be hundreds and thousands of miles away. And what's really um, uh, heartening is that this, this kind of uh, very poor picture that I've painted is truly changing. <clears throat> and um, since now several years, we've seen that elder needs are built into response plans more and more. Um, and that crisis representatives and social services are becoming more aware um, of the need to respond. But they're still lacking, I think, some of the census, um, some of the capacity issues. And uh, so we must do more on that together. And I'm really thrilled to see uh, CanAge's blueprint for this. I think it's absolutely uh, incredible to bring that much uh, information and, and uh, all of the different uh, dimensions together into one plan that that certainly in, in a federation like Canada will, will be key reading for our provinces and, and uh, the federal government. Um, it's definitely high time that, that we wrap this up though into, into higher gear uh, and ensure that we do have, um, um, that we do take, sorry, climate change, infectious disease and disasters much more uh, seriously. We know that they're going to grow in frequency and severity and a number of those um, will unfortunately um, affect seniors in, in higher uh, uh, regard. 
We know, for example, that zoonotic diseases will continue to shift and are spreading as we speak further uh, to the north. And this uh, will only increase as we continue to degrade the last of the planet's wild spaces and as temperatures begin to rise in earnest. We've already seen here in Canada, Lyme disease, and to the south of us in the US, chikungunya and, and dengue moving northward all the way up into Florida. And this, of course, just says nothing of respiratory viruses like SARS and COVID that, uh, that can spread globally. Even without these pandemics, though, we are all seen and been witnessing in Canada the rising uh, smog warnings, uh, largely in our areas caused by forest fire smoke, but in other areas that are caused by industrial pollution. Uh, we're seeing multi-day heat waves uh, become more regular, and this will necessitate breathing in cool cen cooling centers and, um, and special uh, rooms in senior centers where uh, this can be accomplished. Uh, we know that uh, erratic storms are going to continue and be the norm, so we're going to see more ice storms, uh, blizzards, and this type of thing, which uh, will require home visitation checks, warming centers, um, and disaster preparedness, uh, so that these centers can be autonomous, um, certainly for at least three days, if not up to a week. And um, we've mentioned already on the disease burden and vaccinations. Uh, it is heartening to see and to have heard from the health minister in Canada, though it's not uh, um, public yet, that we uh, look to be intending to follow CDC and, and WHO guidelines, where in a case of positive triage, uh, the elderly would certainly be amongst those first in line for vaccination, along with uh, our uh, healthcare and frontline workers. But this will still be quite a huge challenge. Um, the CDC and WHO guidelines recommend about 20% of the population uh, once you add in all of the different uh, um, population groups that are front of the line. And in Canada, that's about 6 to 7 million people that would need to be vaccinated and likely with two and in some places up to three doses. So it's a huge logistical challenge. And there's also um, a, a huge issue of equity that we haven't uh, tapped on here, uh, which is the cost of these vaccines. Uh, right now, we're being told that the vaccines will cost between five and a hundred dollars uh, for the doses that will be required per person. Uh, this uh, is absolutely, uh, will come absolutely at the cost of other types of services, including some of the things that we'll be recommending here today, uh, because someone has to pay for it, and that will be the state in Canada where these vaccines will likely be free. Uh, but we are paying for the research, we are taking the risk, and then we're not limiting the, the cost and we absolutely have to cap the cost in order to be able to cover other things. And we have to know also that we can't be safe here in Canada unless the whole world has access to the vaccine to stop the global pandemic. Otherwise it'll just come back and I see you popping up. So maybe my time is done. Um, and so I'll leave it there for now. Thanks very much, Stephen. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, I'm going to now jump into our poll. So as you mute your video and, and come back from the uh, come back from our proverbial stage, Stephen, I will invite our first poll. So Christiane, um, what is our first poll question? And for those participants, you'll see it coming up now. I'll read it out, but you should see it pop up on your screen. Do you think Canadian seniors have enough information about vaccine? That's a yes, no question. So you got to commit. Question number one, do you think Canadian seniors have enough information about vaccine? Number two, should the government cover the cost of NACI recommended vaccines? That's the, uh, that's the organization at the federal level that makes decisions about what is covered. Um, so the question is, should the government cover the cost of NACI recommended vaccines for seniors? And the third question is, do you feel that you would benefit from education on infection prevention and control in regard to COVID-19? I know that's just about the only thing I feel like I'm doing these days is trying to learn more about that. So again, I'll, I'll just let our poll open for another minute. First question, do you think Canadian seniors have enough information about vaccines? Question two, should the government cover the cost of the NACI recommended vaccines for seniors? Again, that's the organization that makes the recommendations at the governmental level. Um, or not. And question number three is, do you feel that you would benefit from education on infection prevention and control in regards to COVID-19? All right, I'm just going to end our poll now. Let's see what we got for results. So only 17% of people thought that Canadian seniors do have enough information about vaccines, but 83%, which is pretty overwhelming, uh, certainly thinks that there's a great opportunity. 
Should the government cover the cost of NACI recommended vaccines for seniors? 96% of our respondents said yes, and one said no. And number three, do you feel that you would benefit from education on infection prevention and control in regards to COVID-19? 87% of our respondents said yes, and 13 percent said no. So very interesting. Thank you for that. We really appreciate it. At this point, I'm going to invite all of our expert panels to unmute their video and come to the stage. And for those of you who are watching at home, if you uh, want to make sure that you adjust it so you can have all of our great speakers in your window. I know that some people would be on iPads and some people would be on um, computers and you may need to adjust it. So again, I'll encourage each of our speakers to unmute their video and then they can join us on the stage. This is the part where I get to do a bit of a moderated panel and, uh, and be able to ask. We've got a whole bunch of questions in it. So usually I usually I roll in straight into it, but I'm going to do a, a stage setting because we've been using a little bit of jargon here, and I just want to make sure that we can go to you, Dr. Wilson. You know, we sometimes talked about, you know, the, the NACI recommendations. We've talked about kind of high dose flu or, you know, seniors doses and whatever. Can I ask you to give participants a little bit of a primer in the landscape? So we heard from Umberto that he was saying that his father was, you know, looking for a particular kind of flu for vaccine, but then there was the other kind. Maybe just share a little bit of, you know, what is different about, quote, seniors vaccines and, and how do they, how do they get decided? Maybe just set the stage for us a bit there. Sure. I'm going to give a bit of an editorial comment as well. So when we made this app for Canada, Can Immunize, uh, we, it was a complicated process because there isn't one schedule for Canadians. Each province has its own schedule. And then they have different, you have a schedule for children and for adults. So in Canada, the decision is left to the provinces and what vaccines they will recommend and fund. This is different than the United States. The United States is a single vaccine schedule for the whole country. Uh, what makes it more complicated though, is the federal government through NACI will recommend what vaccines should be provided. So you can have this disconnect where there are recommended but unfunded vaccines. And, and that's sort of where some of these high dose vaccines will, will, will fall in that gap. They could be recommended by NACI, but not necessarily funded. And then you create this equity gap that has been referred to. So, so that's sort of the, the landscape. And, and it does confuse Canadians because you would argue that you know, we should all be getting access to the same vaccine and funded, funding for the same vaccine. And in particular, because these diseases do cross provincial borders, you know, I, I strongly believe we should have just a national approach to this where the NACI recommends and then those vaccines are funded. And, and I, I, Greg, I see you nodding here. Do you want to jump in a little bit on that as well? I know that from the Australian system, of course, is a similar version to Canada in that it has their Commonwealth government, which was like our federal government, and has states like our provinces. What's the experience that you have um, in the Australian model? You may need to unmute. I'm unmuted. Um, it's a national system. So while you have states and provinces, um, just like we do here in, in Canada, it's a national strategy around pharma care. Um, it's a national standard around long-term care. It's a national system around building design and quality of care. Um, so, you know, Canada, and I've said this a few times um, when I've spoken, even in the Senate, that Canada discriminates against its older population based on where they live. And it certainly does, because depending on where you live, it's going to depend on what access you have to healthcare and medications. Thanks very much. We have a huge number of questions in our chat box today and in our Q&A. And so I'm going to invite our team member, our policy officer, Vanessa Sparks, to join us. Vanessa, thank you so much for being our host today with our questions. What is our first question for our expert panel? So uh, today our first question comes from Ken Kuhn. I hope I'm saying your name right, from Port Moody, BC. Um, and that question is, how can provinces that do not have the high dose influenza vaccine provided at no cost to seniors lobby the government and, or use the, and use the data from Ontario to support our ask to have this coverage? 
Well, that's a hard one. Okay, and lots of it. Now I know that lots of people have been trying to do it. So maybe I'll actually turn to you, Umberto, because you have taken this up as a really passionate aspect, not only in your role as a pharmacist, but as someone also with lived experience. So I'll invite you to unmute and maybe you could share with us a little bit about how you shared some of your advocacy. And I know that there has been increased coverage since you do it. And I will, uh, I'll do a bit of a round table with some other folks after that. Okay. Uh, well, when I look back at uh, my dad's situation, I, the first thing that came to my mind is how many other seniors have to go through this in order for a provincial government to realize it is a necessary vaccine to be part of the coverage for seniors. So if the, if the information is available to the respective uh, areas of provincial governments that a vaccine is effective, it is beneficial for a select population, and it, it really is a, is a way for the government to see that it is necessary to be part of their formulary and to be covered for that specific population because why risk having so many individuals be hospitalized for an event that could be for events that could be potentially avoided and i i, I think at the time my dad had asked me if it was available the flu zone hd he had come across it through someone else and i knew it was available but unfortunately at the time it was not available. That being said, he actually indicated to me he would have paid a thousand dollars each for my mother and him if it was available in order not to go through what he went through. So I think uh, the, the government, it, it's important for them to step back and say, let's look at the information, let's look at the data and what do we have in front of us? What do we have available that supports our endorsement, our payment, for this medication, for this vaccine, what will be the outcomes, what will be the benefits? And maybe I'll just add to that as well. As an organization, you know, one of the things that we're developing right now are scorecards for different provinces because most people just don't know what they don't know, right? And so what's covered in one jurisdiction or not covered in the other jurisdiction. And I can tell you one of the ways that advocacy works, I think, quite well is to, you know, go to a province, go to a minister of health and finance because someone has to pay for it as well and share with them, you know, what's happening in other jurisdictions and then wherever possible the cost benefit benefit analysis. I have to say, you know, public health and, and, and vaccines have always been quite low on the list of priorities. We often focus on acute health issues first, but then there is this opportunity. I think, you know, sadly, there is this opportunity and focus on vaccines. So I think that actually advocacy in this area is a really important one. I'm going to turn again to Vanessa. Who else do we have on for our expert panelists? I, know, I can see the questions just pouring in. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, there you go. Yep. I'm muted. Classic Zoom. Um, so our next question is from Brett in BC. Uh, and he writes, a lot of younger people feel like they never get the flu. They never get sick. So why get a flu shot? Do you think this kind of attitude will extend to COVID when we do have a vaccine? Um, and how do we message that getting a vaccine protects loved ones as well? Well, I'm going to call first on Dr. Wilson because your work really is across the life course. And then Stephen, maybe I'll, after Dr. Wilson, I'll pop over to you as well and take that piece. You know, we do hear time and time again, ah, I never get sick. Or if I get sick, it's just going to be, I'll be fine. Um, how do we communicate that more life course perspective about, you know, the ones that we're looking at and that we have vaccine for? And then also, you know, how are we thinking about some of that messaging for a COVID vaccine? Sure. I think it's going to be easier with a COVID vaccine. And like, if we want to get out of this, we have to get to herd immunity, which is at a level at which the, the reproductive number drops below one. That means for every individual that's infected, less than one individual gets infected. If we have a 60% effective vaccine, we're going to have to have 90% of the population covered. So, you know, that if young people want to get out of this, and I think they will want to get out of this, this is terrible for them. They'll want to play their role in getting the immunity up to that level. That being said, the biggest concern up front isn't going to be people not wanting to get vaccinated. It's, not going, to, it's going to be that there may not be enough vaccine for everyone. It's, this is going to be a massive production challenge and we may only have enough vaccine for 20% and we need to prioritize those who need it. So uh, you know, I, I think we'll have time to get everybody on board. I think we need to get the vaccines to those who need it first. 
and then you know hopefully I think the messaging will be there for them. In your work, you know, Stephen, you have, you know, you've worked in Canada, you've worked globally, and as you're thinking about coming into your incoming position as Director General of Médecins Sans Frontières, you know, you have to think about that whole life course perspective when it comes to these issues. You spoke a little bit about triaging too. I wonder if you could just reflect on, you know, how do we communicate for younger people who may be more resilient, how important it is from a herd immunity question or a, or a community question? Well, I think the, the communicating to young people, we definitely need to not be communicating the way we have been. We have been communicating to middle-aged uh, people via our government representatives. And those messages aren't getting through to young people. So we'll need to start having young people and people that young people look up to as ambassadors that are communicating the types of messages that they'll be sensitive to. It will be a very big challenge for a number of reasons. Um, this, we have this idea uh, because we're so individualistic that all of these uh, issues are about me. Uh, and these issues are really about public health. And that's not the way that we normally look at things. So it is important uh, that we get the messaging out about protecting others. But then we're, as uh, Dr. Wilson pointed out, uh, we're going to be not having enough access to vaccine to be able to vaccine, vaccinate everyone. And so we're going to have to do this in stages. I'm really rather surprised that we haven't nationalized vaccine production. We've nationalized the production of respirators, of masks, of all kinds of things, but not vaccines. And we know that there are only a few vaccine uh, makers and uh, very limited production lines. So it would be incumbent upon us at this time, I would think, to, to nationalize that. I am not as confident as, as Dr. Wilson on vaccine upkeep, uh, sadly, um, in uh, North America, there's already a poll out of the U.S. suggesting that 50% of people wouldn't take the vaccine. That may well change if mortality changes. Um, and it's not a peer-reviewed science, but, but we do know that there's a very strong anti-vax movement. We see it wrapped up with a, a lot of conspiracy theories. Uh, we see also overseas, uh, and we, we see this in every massive vaccination campaign, whether it's measles or, or tuberculosis or polio. Um, there are always rumors that spread uh, about uh, what the intention of a vaccination campaign might be. And so uh, pickup will be a problem to reach 90% herd immunity. And the last part is, um, I've already mentioned it, but there is no way at five to $100 that we're going to vaccinate uh, the 8 billion people on the planet to stop this. So we absolutely have to cap profits and nationalized production, I would think, if we're going to be able to have uh, the, enough doses uh, to go around. Yeah, it's a global perspective. It's really important. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Vanessa, let's go to our next question. I know there was one on records, and I think record keeping is one of those important questions. Yeah, so Sarah from Ontario asks, people may not be able to recall all the vaccines they have previously received or what vaccines are required or suggested. Uh, can you speak to how information about vaccines is communicated and how vaccine records are stored and tracked? Okay, well, this is ready for you, Dr. Wilson, because the yeah. this is like a gift over to right. Becky oh, yes. to talk about the act. And then, Greg, maybe I'll pull upon you on that same question after Dr. Wilson, if I may. So over to you. So this is important even right now, but it's going to be really important with the COVID vaccine. We need to track vaccines at an individual level, and we haven't done a great job of that in Canada. And we need to track it based on the, the vaccine they received, the trade name, and ideally even the lot number and more specific information. So, you know, can immunize is one way to do that. Each province and territory has its own registry. They're not connected. That's another problem. But you know, they are also collecting this information. But very few collect data on adults. I think PEI had the only adult immunization registry. We're going to need this suddenly in four months for a COVID vaccine release. And I'll tell you why. There may not be one vaccine. There could be six vaccines out there. And we're going to need to get a booster. So you're going to get a vaccine. You're not going to sure which COVID vaccine you get. And then you're going to have to come back in two to six months or whatever the time period is. And you have to make sure you get the same vaccine you got the first time. So you have to have a system to track that at the individual level. And I really hope Canada has that in place. And we're happy to play our role. But for the COVID vaccine, it's going to be particularly essential. I'll just ask you to pull on that same idea, Greg. So from your perspective, the tracking question. Uh, 
it's going to be absolutely essential that we're able to track older people, particularly around the COVID vaccine. But equally important, I mean, how many older people know what vaccines they've had? When does anyone on this panel know when they had their last tetanus shot, for argument's sake? I mean, there isn't the record keeping in this country for older people. They're a, um, they're a missed community in terms of keeping records. We've got to keep records for children. We should be keeping them for adults in some way, shape or form. Um, Australia was one of the first countries that actually had an electronic record for adult immunisation. Um, and that was about four or five years ago. So it is being picked up, but I think COVID-19 is going to press governments to have an electronic record somehow, some shape or form, particularly around COVID, which will then extend to other immunisation programs. Yeah, Umberto, I'm just going to ask you to pull upon your experience as a as a pharmacist in this. You know, when people come in your professional experience, you know, do they know what they've taken? Do, are are they able to be able to find that information out easily, or is it your experience the opposite? Well, un unfortunately, uh, there were a few, uh, quite a few instances where I ask and they don't know. And there are some who carry actually, and I have one myself, a card. It's it's an older card, and they're the immunization cards. Uh, but realistically, there, there needs to be, I, I think, better record keeping. For instance, when the pharmacies uh, administer the influenza vaccine, we keep uh, records of that. We keep records of uh, administration of vaccines, uh, whichever ones we do give. And, and something that I remember a physician saying to me uh, when I did a uh, webinar last year with the Ontario Lung Association, in, in this, I, I was surprised how many times pharmacies don't relay to physicians' offices, I gave the patient the uh, influenza vaccine, or this patient received this vaccine from my pharmacy. So th that has to be, uh, you know, looked at and developed in such a way that there's constant communication amongst the healthcare professionals that there is administration of the vaccine, where, who, when, and of course, documentation indicating so. Yeah, so I think technology can help us, but also our integrated systems as well. I'm going to sneak two more questions in because they're fantastic. They're just rolling in hot and heavy here. Vanessa, who's our next question? So this is an anonymous question from the Q&A. Um, how can we best explain to older adults and people in general that a vaccine created in such a short amount of time is or will be safe to take? So I think referring to the COVID-19 vaccine. I hear from a lot of people that they do not want to take the vaccine when it first comes out. They do not want to be the guinea pigs. Yeah, who wants to take that one first? <laughs> I'm going to turn to you, Dr. A... Wilson, if I may. Sure. I, I think it's important to be respectful of the concerns of people. The, 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 you know, the, the, this is a rapid development process. Pandemic vaccines in the past have had some challenges uh, with safety that there was an issue in Europe with uh, the adjuvant and narcolepsy with the H1N1 vaccine. In 76, there was an issue of GBS. Canada's got a couple of gaps here we need to fill. Uh, one is clear informed consent when you receive the vaccine. We have to treat people like they are participants in their health care. They need to be informed. Adults, older Canadians need to be provided that information in a way they can understand. A second thing that I've been advocating for for 20 years, which is a real gap in Canada, we need to have a vaccine injury compensation program in place. We're the only G7 country that doesn't have it. Quebec's got it. 26 other countries have it. Nepal and Vietnam have it. And it may actually might be a requirement for us to receive a vaccine from a vaccine manufacturer. So this is a, these are programs where, the, to no fault of anyone, people do get injured at probably rates of one in a million. There is a program to provide assistance to those individuals so they don't need to go through the tort system. Thank you. That's really helpful. Okay, there Vanessa, is a, one know, other issue on this, sure, and that is that the the current uh, batch of vaccines, their efficacy rates uh, are being set by the manufacturers. And that efficacy rate uh, for passing is between 30 and 50 percent. And I'm certainly hopeful that it's going to be far more uh, uh, efficient than that. But uh, if it isn't, then the, we will have questions on, on do we want to actually to roll it out to everyone or should we be rolling it out to that 20 percent that would be seniors at the front of the yeah, line? That's uh, really and then perhaps waiting until we have further developments. 
Yeah, that's very, very helpful. I mean, that question of prioritization triage is, is a really, really important one. And I mean, I want to flag, you know, <laughs> one of the things that makes me crazy, which is the vaccine hesitancy for things like, you know, viral pneumonia, for things like flu, for things like shingles, where we have I know, excellent deep and profound research on it, but we're still seeing, particularly in BC, the rise of uh, vaccine evidence and, and misinformation. That's something that we're really going to work on. I know I want to get a couple more questions in before our time is up. Vanessa, what's next on our agenda? Uh, so we have a question from Brett in BC. Um, what kind of mental health strategy is necessary to support seniors during responses to disasters? Okay, that's over to you. That's an excellent question. You know, we're often thinking about trying to get immediate food, water, you know, the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. And yet we know that the impact of disasters and in certain, I mean, to the degree that we call a pandemic a disaster, it certainly is as well. We know the mental health impact we've had. Stephen, you've worked across Canada and all over the world. What are your thoughts about mental health supports for older people in the times of disasters? Well, I think we've learned over the past decade that, in fact, mental health support in times of disaster is uh, is part of the emergency toolkit for everyone, and uh, and would be even more so uh, for uh, seniors and others who um, could end up being more at risk, uh, separated and isolated. So uh, there are a number of things that that uh, that can and, and should be done. One is is pre-disaster is to have the links between. Uh, the community, the caregiver, and the frontline assistance already in place and made. So seniors uh, will know some of their caregivers, uh, will know what to expect. Uh, this, of course, isn't always uh, possible, but it certainly should be possible in a country like Canada. Um, overseas, uh, where it's not possible, um, then you simply come with, um, with uh, humanitarian values and, uh, and humanity and extend every uh, care and convenience that, that you can to make sure that, uh, that the seniors aren't falling through the cracks. But it is, it is very difficult to be able to um, roll out mental health support on a macro level. Most of the um, interventions are in small groups or individual, and that can be a, a challenge in, in very isolated and remote settings. Uh, Laura, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you. It's really helpful. You know, so often when we're thinking about, you know, health and what does health mean, we don't necessarily think about all aspects of health and, and the resilience that's required to continue to get up every day and to, to reach out and be part of community. Certainly when we were going through our um, major paper, our Voices of Canada's Seniors, a Roadmap to an Age Inclusive Canada, you know, we look through a number of key lenses and I invite people to have a look at the lens statement where you see some of the different ones that we look through and, and sort of mental health and inclusion issues of rural remote and how, you know, differential impacts of historically and marginalized people, uh, you know, are affecting that. So we took a whole health point of view and very much an intersectional point of view. I was really glad to see that question because it's not an easy one. I could keep going and I, and I know that we've had wonderful audience q and A. I'm mindful of our time of our experts and are mindful of our time of our participants today. So I'm just gonna close this active Q and A session with a, a few extra resources that I wanna share with you today. You know, our website is canage.ca and we've also put up the websites of our other folks who are here today and I really encourage you to have a look at them. The Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, you can see there. And I again, also have a look at the Briere uh, institutes for research are fantastic. Our good friends and co-hosts at the International Federation on Aging have a wealth of resources and in particular the Vaccines for Life program and website that they have. Really everything that you need to know you'll see on their Vaccines for Life website. They've also been hosting wonderful series webinars about you know, global uh, vaccination processes and have been releasing country by country reports on vaccines. And I encourage you to have a look at the Canadian one, which was just released quite recently. The David Suzuki Foundation has been a leader in Canada and globally, and you'll see the website there. But while we're at it, I'm going to make a little plug for Médecins Sans Frontières with Doctors Without Borders as well. Um, I know that they play such an incredible role, and I know, Stephen, that 
as you transition to that role, you'll be bringing that big, big response, that mega trend as we're talking about responses. And, and we're so grateful that you're also taking a life course approach when you're thinking about the work that's getting done at that level. Alberto's story was incredibly powerful. And I encourage you, we put the link here, which you, in this website and information will be posted and shared to you as all participants have a watch of that particular video. Um, if you have a dry eye at the end of it, you're, you're stronger than I am because I, uh, I was a weeping fool. And I have to say it was incredibly profound. If you weren't um, passionate about the issue before, I, I, I want to thank you for your advocacy and telling the story of you and your father because it has changed lives. It, we have a wonderful resource that's just out this year. So one of the big issues that we're having is how are we going to get vaccine uptake? How are we going to get that vaccine gateway? We're not having you know, tens of hundreds of people heading to doctor's offices, community health clinics, and pharmacies in the way that we would do those big vaccine uptake initiatives. And people are not at the downtown towers or in office buildings, again, doing those mass vaccinations. So here is a wonderful resource that you can go to that's brought out by Immunize Canada. It's called myfluShot.ca. And again, this link is provided to you. So and I've signed up for this. So if I put my little location in there by city, or if there's a particular clinic or pharmacy that you're interested in, you can enter your location and an email where they can write to you behind this scene are providers of vaccines like pharmacies and doctor's offices and so on and they see that you have registered your interest in getting the flu shot and they can reach out to you you'll be notified when the flu shots are available in your area and uh, and then there's this matching again it's a uh, it's a wonderful immunized canada initiative to make sure that people are able to get the flu shot where they are and where they would like to get it. So again, myfluShot.ca, a great initiative of Immunize Canada. All of these resources and these recordings are going to be available on our website at canage.ca slash webinars, on our YouTube channels. Our co-hosts and our presenting partners will also be sharing them and we encourage you to share them widely as well. If you've been inspired, we encourage you to, tell, to take action and download our roadmap. It was drafted for everybody. And so you as an individual or a senior or as part of a community or a company or part of a government can go and have a look at what you can do to help to make Canada more age inclusive. Help Age Canada has been at the forefront of supporting philanthropic engagement. So if you're interested in supporting you can absolutely do that by going through their website at, Canada, at Help Age Canada and donate to their wonderful initiatives, which include sort of emergency-based microloans and a lot of great initiatives as well in the North um, and in the Arctic. Be a member. It doesn't cost you anything. You get a one-year free membership to CanAge, and this way you'll get a wealth of extra resources, our newsletter, and you can also raise your voice. You're part of that advocacy process to make Canada more age-inclusive. So again, you can join at canage.ca slash join. We have more to come in our free online conference. In fact, this afternoon, depending on where you are, or later this morning, if you're on the West Coast, we have an incredible session on caregiving, long-term care, home care, and housing resources. And believe me, this session is going to be really very informed by our conversations that we're having around COVID-19 and what's been happening with the older adult population, but also looking at, you know, what is the role of home care and how is affordable housing going to move forward in the future? So that's in a short period of time, starting at Eastern, 1 p.m. And you can see some other times depending on where you're calling in from. We're not done yet. Uh, here we go. Here's our incredible set of panelists. So we have Rachel Blaney. She's at the federal NDP. She was the seniors and veterans affairs critic and is now the whip for the federal NDP. And certainly in a time of uh, uncertain future at the federal level, the NDP are playing an important role, I think, for the liberals. So we'll hear a little bit about what she has to say around these issues. We have a trio and a trio on purpose. We have Donna Duncan, who is the executive director of the Ontario Long-Term Care Association, Amy Capel, who is the executive director and CEO of the Ontario Caregiver Organization, and 
D. Lender, who is the executive director of the Ontario Association of Residents Councils. They are together because we know that they bring a diversity of perspectives and we thought it would be helpful to have one jurisdiction. We're also joined by Jennifer Wadakajic, who is from Northern Ontario School of Medicine, and she'll be especially talking about this issue in the North, in Nunavut in particular, and Indigenous and in Inuit populations. So we'll have a really great opportunity, and she may be joined by a, a local Inuit elder um, as well for that particular work. And then tomorrow, I'm just going to flag for you before I let you go. Don't forget our last day of our free conference is tomorrow. Again, starting at the same time we did for this session, 11 Eastern. And we're going to talk about economic security. We're going to talk about pensions, consumer credit and debt, securities regulation, and how to support a retirement in uncertain times. We're going to learn more about how each of these organizations can become more age inclusive and as you as consumers can do better in these challenging times. Our last session is tomorrow afternoon, starting between 1 and 2.30 Eastern Standard Time on social inclusion. We're going to be talking digital literacy. We're going to talk ageism, the role of libraries, how better at home programs and men's sheds can support um, supporting against mental health decline and loneliness. We're going to talk about co-housing, affordable options, and innovative ways to connect community and people together intergenerationally. Don't miss this great session that's going to wrap up our conference. Please reach out at any time. I'm at laura at canage.ca or you can just reach out to our general line at info.canage.ca and again don't forget to join for a free membership. Our social media is here, you'll get our newsletters and feel free to share this information and your thoughts about infection prevention and disaster response and how to make Canada more age inclusive or any other issue at our social media. Thank you so much for joining today. We know how important your time is and we're really grateful as well to each of our expert panelists for sharing their stories, sharing their insights. What a rock star group. We're so delighted that you were able and very generously gave of your time for us today. Thanks everyone. I'll, uh, I'll ask our panelists to unmute themselves and wave goodbye. And we will uh, we'll join again in about half an hour. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone.